now El Dorado Museum. This um, building was originally an 1870s schoolhouse and actually had uh, 450 students and nine teachers. In 1967 it became the El Dorado Museum Trust's uh, building and then in 1971 it was officially opened and here we are today in this fantastic little representation of history and uh, telling the story of El Dorado from the gold mining era through to about the 1950s. People were drawn to El Dorado because of the alluvial, alluvial gold and tin. Uh, it was a very rich field and in the 1860s uh, the mining of deep leads began and this continued through the 1870s. There are quite a number of mines working and the population at that time was about four and a half thousand people so the field became very very busy and uh, it continued for quite a number of years. I'm talking here with Jeff Milne. Jeff's a uh, long-time resident of El Dorado. He's actually lived here all his life and his family has actually had five generations in El Dorado. So Jeff, your um, family's actually had a significant contribution to the uh, collection in the museum, around about 20 or so percent of the items that are there. And a few of them in that first case, in the, in the first room there. There's some items there that you could tell us about that you recall? There is different things that went well back in family history and uh, items that were brought out from Scotland, shaving mug and there's a statue there and I can't remember what it is now, <laughs> the name, the smoker's cap and the pipe, different glassware and things that were brought out when the family come out. Right, yeah. And there's not much left at our place. <laughs> we want the footy cup. <laughs> You're not going to get it. I decided to uh, try and gather some family history and I wrote a book called El Dorado Gold, an Australian Story. Um, after I realised that a lot of the older residents of El Dorado who had ancestors in the area, um, that they were starting to either get ill or pass away and a lot of the stories were going to be lost so I decided to record them. The mining um, from the 1860s to, the, to about 1900 was mainly deep lead which is shafts um, sunk to as far down as 210 feet with tunnels going off and uh, this was a very dangerous uh, type of mining for this area because of the water content in the ground. Consequently, there were quite a number of accidents. The worst one was what we call the McAvoy disaster in 1895, and that uh, took the lives of six men. Unfortunately, they met, these men were entombed at the end of a shaft, and they were, their bodies weren't recovered for a couple of weeks, and it was a very, very horrible time for the families in the town. Eventually, the deep lead mining stopped, and open sluice and began, and then, we, of course, we had the dredge. When the miners were trapped in the McAvoy disaster, they, the only thing they had with them was their billies for, for their lunch, and so they scratched messages on the on the billies in the they were quite dark and they scratched messages to their families very poignant messages um, uh, and we, we've sort of tried to trace those billies but we can't find them we did think they're in the mines department in Melbourne but nobody's been able to locate them at the moment the most rewarding thing that came out of my book for me was meeting many, many hundreds of people virtually, um, but some special ones that had that were descendants of the original miners and I made some wonderful friendships and I still keep in contact with quite a few of them. So that to me was really um, a, a great pleasure to meet those people. The museum's like my baby and it takes a lot of nurturing, a lot of care, it takes a lot of research and it takes a lot of love and it's something that I just am totally enamoured with. I have several roles at the museum. I do the uh, president's job, but that's also now involving being the liaison. I clean, I curate, 
I take people uh, around the museum and do, a, a, do sort of the guided tours. I take groups through. This area of the museum is um, set up with a desk to do with family history items. Um, I love chasing up family history for people, looking through the old rolls, looking through the dredge information. One of the interesting stories that we have um, at the museum is, is a story that goes with the Ned Kelly corkscrew. And this was a corkscrew that Ned Kelly was reputed to have used when he came back from the Gerildery robbery when he stopped at a hotel at 2am in the morning. Mari Mull, the proprietress of the hotel at that time, gave him the, the bottle of brandy and the corkscrew and he had his drink, took it out and offered it to his mates and headed on his way. And that story actually came from Mary's daughter-in-law who took over the hotel after Mary and she, she actually, Annie Mull, gave us the corkscrew and the story. We don't actually go out and collect items for the museum anymore because we do have quite a few things in the collection, but we do actually have people who decide that they've got some things that they think might be quite valuable and would like the museum to have them. So, Jeff, tell us a little bit about your family and, and the history with the uh, butcher's cart that we have here in the museum. Well, I'll try and give you a, a picture of it. It was uh, back in the... Uh, 18th century when the original ancestors arrived back in 1862. We were sure they were here then. And uh, go back to the great great grandfather, and uh, we come from there to the Milne family. Right. And uh, there was dad and my brother and myself. Right. The butcher's cart, the one we still have here. It was, uh, it would be back in the, uh, well, 1940s that I did drive it myself. Like this one, it would do the rounds of the town and country. And uh, that would uh, happen every day of the week. Currently, to make the museum more contemporary, we've actually created a website and um, that has a visual tour on it. So you can actually visit the museum and, and actually go around these three rooms and uh, actually see what's in the museum. I think in the short term, though, the museum really needs to be focused on in terms of preserving what we have so that it's actually here for future generations. One of the most rewarding things about what I do here is being with people. So I just love the, the opportunity to be with all the people who come to the museum and talk about what we have and what we did and what the history and the significance was of El Dorado. Mm -hmm.